confession. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of the forgiveness of sins that you proclaim to your people throughout your church through all times. Be with us as we study how you bring this gift to us and help us always to value this gift, to cherish this gift, and to make use of this gift that you have placed in our midst. All this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, confession. Confession is something that has, um, well, it's been in the church since the very beginning. Our Lord in John chapter 20 established within his holy church the office of the keys. And that office of the keys he gave to us in order that we would receive the forgiveness of sins, that we would receive the absolution. Now, corporate confession was not a part of the divine service for the first 1,800 years of the history of the church. And so confession was practiced by meeting individually with your pastor, usually as part of preparation for receiving the sacrament of the altar. Time was set aside, usually the night before, for individuals to come and to receive individual absolution prior to the usual Vesper service that took place on Saturday evenings. Time was also allotted on Sunday morning prior to the service for those who lived far distant from the church as well as the elderly and the infirm who would not have been able to make it the night before. Confession was a time of catechesis. It was a time of teaching. It was a time of learning. A time of learning about the sacrament of the altar. A time of learning about vocation of who you are as God's chosen one, living a life in the world. That's why I like to pair individual confession and absolution with pastoral counseling. Usually there are things that come up in individual pastoral counseling sessions that would be driving one, leading one towards, oh, that's something I need absolution for. That's something I could use the comfort of the gospel applied towards that thing in my life. Now, many pastors I know begin their pastoral counseling sessions with that time of individual confession and absolution and then use that counseling time as instruction. I like to organize the sessions um, more along the lines of that counseling time is a time of examination, a time where we flesh out the things that uh, might possibly be troubling, the one who has come, and then we top the counseling session off if they so desire with that individual absolution now being applied to all of those things we've just been discussing. Individual confession and absolution doesn't have to necessarily be um, in connection uh, with those extended pastoral counseling sessions. Um, in fact, Historically, it often had not been, um, but rather it was just, it was someone uh, who had come up, and then they, uh, they come up, the, the, the rite that is included in our hymnal is, it really, it's very brief. Hey, I would like to confess, would you please absolve me? Yeah, we can do that. I'm a sinner, and here's where I goofed up. 
God in Christ forgives those sins too. That's why Jesus came. Perhaps here are a few other passages that point out how Jesus specifically forgave those sins by his life and his passion and his death and his resurrection. Go in peace. Five minutes or less. It can be. Um, some people uh, don't like that conversation. Um, and so they, they don't come. They wouldn't come if they had the opportunity. I don't want to have to actually look at my life. I, I, let me just show up and go, yep, I'm a sinner. And I'd actually have to figure out how many different ways I don't even want to think about all of the ways that I have sinned against God in this past week. Although part of the difficulty of doing that is we don't begin to address those ways that we go astray. As numbers in congregations rose, especially in large towns that had larger congregations, um, together with the rise of pietism. Pietism is different than piety. Pietism is that teaching that creeps into the church on a rather regular and periodic cycle that emphasizes the emotional fervor of one's confession rather than the pronouncement of absolution or the application of God's word to one's life. You starved four of your children to death. Yeah, but I'm really, 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 really sorry about that. Okay, you can be really, really, really sorry about that, but feed kids number five, six, and seven. No, but I'm really, really, really sorry about starving one through four to death. That's fine. But that means you have to change. No, but I'm really, really, really sorry. It's not about how sincere your confession is. I mean, yes, your confession should be sincere. But we're not having a sincerity contest. We're looking for truth. We're looking at speaking together with God who we are, which includes speaking that condemnation of the law upon our sinfulness together with the forgiveness that he brings to us. So by the end of the 17th century, the 1600s, the Vespers service on Saturday night had turned into a service of corporate confession and absolution. Because we got to get everybody absolved. So everybody just show up. And y'all do your... Dear God, I'm really, 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 really sorry. Do that at home. And then when you show up at Vespers, I'll just forgive all y'all. And we'll do it all together, because I have time to talk to each of you individually. Since you could crunch through larger numbers, and I put this in my notes, ka -ching. Since you could crunch through those larger numbers, the corporate services became more commonplace. And private confession and absolution declined, but it didn't completely disappear. But it did decline. The, the lowest spot, the nadir, 
for private confession and absolution within our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod came in the middle of the 20th century when neither the Lutheran hymnal published in 1941 nor the new translation of the small catechism published in 1943 included any guidance on how to confess sins privately to your pastor. Just do it. Two generations later, with the publication of Lutheran worship and a new edition or translation of the small catechism published in the early 1980s, the tide began to turn, but two generations is long enough to all but completely eliminate a tradition or practice. I mean, think about the good old-timey hymns. When someone says, I want to sing the good old hymns, Look at when the good old hymns were written. The 1890s. The 1910s. You bring a hymn, you sing a hymn from the 1500s. We don't like that new stuff. Let's sing a hymn from the 1910s. Those good old hymns that have been sung for two generations in place of the 400, 500-year-old hymns. It only takes about two generations to completely replace a tradition or a practice. So as we rediscover this tradition, let's go all the way back to what our Lutheran confessions say about this practice. And remember that every time the Lutheran confessions say something about confession and absolution, they're talking about individual confession and absolution because this didn't take place in a broad service together corporately. When the small catechism says, what is confession? It's talking about going and confessing and receiving absolution individually from your pastor. It's not talking about that thing that's at the beginning of our order of Holy Communion. That didn't exist yet and wouldn't exist for another 300 years. So the small catechism, the handout that's here on the table, this is, I just went through um, the, the confessions. I did not type it out myself. Copy paste from electronic versions. Um, but I just, I copied and pasted from the documents that are in our Lutheran Book of Concord. Our confessional documents, those things that we have that we say, this is what we believe, teach and confess, and those who believe, teach and confess this, that you're Lutheran. This is what Orthodox Christianity, or what we call Lutheranism, looks like. So what is confession? Y'all went through you all went through confirmation class, so let's all read it together. What is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. This is God at work. This is... A sacrament. I know, we often think of sacraments as, as those things instituted by God for the forgiveness of sins connected to a visible element. Well, 
Don't let the definition run what a sacrament is. Let the Bible tell you what God put in place, and then you can come up with commonalities out of that. We see that the confessors, they understood confession. I mean, they, they don't number the sacraments. Um, the, the Roman church would tell you that there are seven sacraments. The Lutheran church just says, what God made as sacraments are sacraments. There needs to be a, instituted by God and the forgiveness of sins. And together with that, so if you use that two-part definition, really there are three sacraments. Baptism, confession, and the Lord's Supper. And to see that, that is, that's the working definition that the confessors used as they were putting together and, and, and operating there in this, the 16th century, in the 1500s, We'll just look at the structure of the catechism. We'll learn the basic texts, Ten Commandments, Creed, Lord's Prayer. And then we learn life is the church. Baptism, confession, Lord's Supper. By putting confession between baptism and the Lord's Supper, they're saying... Confession is a part of this group. This isn't Sesame Street where you sit there and go, one of these things is not like the other. They're saying these are the same. Confession has been instituted by God. Confession has been given for the forgiveness of sins. And so it is practiced among us. What sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. The small catechism emphasizes that this is confession and absolution. They always go together. You don't have someone come in and say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I've done all of these things. Only to have the person to whom you have confessed say, you will be forgiven if... Go dig a hole 30 feet deep. Then you'll be forgiven. Go pray this much, and then you'll be forgiven. That's not confession. Confession is always connected to absolution. Now, before God, we can, we can confess our sins before God. We confess our sins in our prayers. Because forgiveness... Forgiveness comes in many forms, in many shapes, in many sizes. Confession comes not only in the specific sacramental pronouncement of absolution, but it also comes in the proclamation of the gospel in pastor's sermons. It comes in the proclamation of God's word in the readings, in the introit. God brings His grace, His forgiving grace to us in these many different ways. And Luther points out specifically, as we do in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses. All those things that I don't even know that I did wrong. It didn't even occur to me that what I was doing was wrong. Sometimes you can even be intending to do the right thing, and it's wrong. A few years ago, 
you know, sometimes I am a complete and total idiot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely clueless. Okay, you know the Bill Ingvall, here's your sign? Okay, I, I like have one permanently installed above my head. I was at a basketball game. I know that's like a surprising thing. I was at a basketball game and the local radio station was there. And at that particular time, I did the JV games and we had another guy who did the varsity games. So it was, it was between the JV and the varsity game. So I was done. I had gotten off the scorekeeper's bench. I'm up on the stage there at, at our high school. Scorekeeper's bench is on the stage. And I'm there, and the radio broadcasters are there. And it was before they were going over the internet. And they had their, their little cell antenna set up on a little tripod right there at the corner of the stage. And the, the radio guy said, Pastor Moore, we're trying to keep people cleared out from here so that, because it kind of blocks the signal from the antenna. What I heard was, Pastor Moore, could you help keep people away from here? So I was standing there keeping people away from there, right next to the antenna. What he was saying to me was, Pastor Moore, you make a better door than a window go away. I was trying to do the right thing, but I was doing completely the wrong thing. I was doing exactly what he told me not to do. I was standing there. Sometimes we do that. And we have to say, God, forgive me for those times when we are too dim-witted to even realize that what we're doing is a sin. Forgive us our trespasses. All of them. But God has given to us a great and wonderful blessing because sometimes we do know that the things that we do are trespasses. We do know that the things that we do are sins. The thoughts, the words, the deeds of which I am ashamed. One, um, one of the liturgical forms of confession puts it. And so when we have these specific sins that come to mind, when we have these things that come into our brain, God has sent a messenger to hear it. And to say that thing that continues to bug you and plague you and pester you, God has forgiven. You know, the, the devil likes to work. Yeah, I confess my sins generally, but, you know, there's, there's, there's this one that I, I even have difficulty admitting to my own self that I've done it because it is so awful, I don't even want to say it out loud. Surely God, if God really knew about that one, the devil, if God really knew about that one, like there's something we can hide from God, if God really knew about that one, he wouldn't forgive that one. You know, we, we, we think of God as, you know, like our friends from high school. You know, if my friend from high school really knew what I did, you know, they all went out on Friday night and I said that I was busy. If they really knew what I did on Friday night, they wouldn't be my friend anymore. Because I was just blowing them off because I really didn't want to deal with them. I oh, think that's what God will do to us if he really knows what we did. 
And God has given us this blessing of individual absolution to have that gospel pronounced to that thing too. I've often said this to my, uh, to my youth groups when, when leading a study on, on forgiveness. And I always preface it this way. This is not a challenge. But you can't tell me something that I haven't already heard before. There's not a sin that you can confess that I haven't already heard before. I'm not going to blush. God has it covered. And that's why he sent pastors to hear these confessions, to speak that forgiveness. Now, in his original um, pamphlet of the small catechism, Dr. Luther included, pray, propose to me a brief form of confession. This is a description. This is not, here is the only legal way to do individual confession and absolution. It's a description. It's always easier from a set form. Education, classical education, is based on, on a simple progression of ideas. You go from grammar to logic to rhetoric. Grammar is, here are the pieces. Logic is, okay, the pieces went together this way, but you can also put the pieces together this way. Rhetoric is, let me tell you how to put the pieces together. What is it that they say? You, you, you never truly know a subject until you teach it. That's what rhetoric is. I want to teach you this great thing that I found out. And so this is the, the grammar level. These are the basic building blocks to put together. I mean, when you... <coughs> excuse me. When you... Uh, and we're, we're just concluding the section on prayer um, in, my, in my confirmation class. And there is, there's an outline to a collect. And the mnemonic device that's used to remember this outline for the collect is you, who, do, to, through. You ever notice that pretty much the prayers that we have at the beginning of the service... They name God, you. Oh God. They give an attribute of God, who? Oh God, who created the world. Do. Give me stuff. Two. For what reason? So that I can have food in my belly. Through termination, through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you look at our, our prayer for today, you still have your bulletin. It, it breaks out that way. So I teach that outline to the kids so that at the end of class, when I say, okay, it's your turn to pray to close class, they don't sit there and go, uh... They've got an outline to fill in. When I was first learning how to write... My teacher, sentences had, they were assigned numbers. A number one sentence was an introduction. A number two sentence was a fact. A number three sentence was a little more detail about that fact. A number four sentence was a conclusion. 
and we would get assignments that said, write a 1, 23, 23, 23, 4 paragraph. Okay. So I know my paragraph is going to have this many sentences, and this sentence is an introduction, and this sentence is a this, and this sentence is a this. So that's what Luther's doing for confession. Here's your outline. Here's an example of what to do. Now, later, once you've gotten used to this, you can take off the training wheels. You don't have to go by these exact words. But here's an example. And this is merely to, uh, this is to be merely a general form of confession for the, we, we look at it here on the, uh, uh, on the second page, just a little bit below the middle of the page. Uh, the very last sentence in his, in, his, uh, in, in his example, right before the, what is the office of the keys? This is to be merely a general form of confession for the unlearned. Now we might see that and say, is Luther calling me dumb? Is he calling me stupid? Is he insulting me? This is not an insult or a put down. When, when we see in the confessions about um, things for the, the unlearned or the simple, this is not a put down. This is not, y'all aren't smart in God stuff like me. Um, I like to think of it in terms of um, back in 1991, The International Data Group published a book on computers and computer programming. And this book ended up becoming the first in the most successful how-to book franchise in the history of publishing. It had a very distinctive yellow cover with a title depicted in a black chalkboard on the front. I don't have a copy of that particular book, but I own several from this franchise. Internet for Mac for Dummies. While calling someone a dummy is usually thought of as being insulting, this For Dummies series is the best selling because it is simple in its instructions and it provides that basic information that is needed. And so it is in that same line that 460 years earlier, Luther gave confession for dummies. This is how we do it. This is, this, this is a way that you can do it and, and receive this great blessing. And it is because that God gave the office of the keys to the church, John 20, that this confession, this absolution works. So the, the section on, on confession, it's, it's confession and the office of the keys together. What is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Although, while I critique um, the 1941 catechism for the, uh, the, the leaving out of this uh, example of individual confession and absolution, I do like their answer to the Office of the Keys a little bit better because the Office of the Keys is that peculiar ecclesiastical authority is how that translation puts it. I like it when any 
confessional document or translation of the Bible calls me peculiar. You know the King James Version of 1 Peter. You are a peculiar people. A royal priesthood. We're different than everybody else. And this office of the keys is different. It, nowhere else has it. You cannot go to Governor Pritzker and get absolution. Likewise, you can't go to your pastor to get a pardon. Wonderful uh, scene from the Coen Brothers movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? One of, one of the trio that's, that's running, he, he followed the voice of the sirens to the river. They went down to the river to pray, singing about the good old days. And he went down and he was baptized. Now, if, it, if you know the movie, these three escaped from a chain gang, and so they're being chased by the law, and this guy's sitting in the back seat of the, of the Model T Ford as they're driving rather speedily down, down the, the road, this country road, and he's sitting there going, I don't have anything to worry about. My, my sins have been washed away in the blood of the Lamb. And the driver says, well, that may be the way that God feels about it, but the governor of Mississippi has a different story. <laughs> Your sins may have been washed away in regards to God, but the state of Mississippi still has this crime against you. The office of the keys is something that God has given to the church. The state can't give it to you. This is something that only comes from the church. Now as we continue through, through time, just a couple of years after the small catechism is written, we have the Augsburg Confession. Three lines! That's all they wrote. They're called to explain what is it that you guys are teaching. Of confession, they, meaning our preachers, <coughs> they teach that private absolution ought to be retained in the churches Although in confession an enumeration of all sins is not necessary, for it is impossible according to the psalm, who can understand his errors? And so, and basically the response, which you see in the footnote there, um, it's called the confutation. Uh, the response of the Roman Catholic theologians is, well, yeah, you pretty much have that right. Although we do have two things that, that you really need to make sure. you got to go to confession at least once a year. And what happens... <coughs> excuse me. What happens when you tell someone, you got to go at least... That goes in the ear as... Well, you only have to go, right? Luther wrote, someone had asked him, well, how often should someone receive the sacrament of the altar? And Luther responded, if you don't make it there at least four times a year, you really can't be considered a Christian. So what did Lutherans do with that? We only have it four times a year because if you go more than that, you're pretty uppity. That's what the Pietists did with it within the Lutheran church. So we're only going to offer it four times a year because, you know, we don't want to get too full of ourselves. And in the apology, that's kind of how the, the, the confessors answer. We want to talk about how frequently we don't have to tell people they got to go at least once a year because they're showing up more than that. 
Because they recognize the gift that it is. If your boss says to you, you have to show up at least once a year to pick up your paycheck, how frequently are you going to pick up your paycheck? Whenever it's offered. <laughs> oh no, you can hold on to that until, you know, just hold on to that for another nine months. I'll get in there eventually. This is a great blessing. This is a great blessing that God brings to us in the forgiveness of our sins. And then the, the, uh, the, the, the Roman Catholic theologians, they also uh, kind of double down. Well, well they, they acknowledge that, okay, no one can give all of their sins. You really do need to sit down and try to make an exhaustive list. It's what the Roman Catholic theologians responded. And, and our, our, our Lutheran forefathers went, um, no. If you know about it, I mean, we need to learn how to examine our lives, yes. But we shouldn't be forcing people to go. We shouldn't be forcing people into a, a, to disturbing their consciences. In fact, Luther was so bothered by this requirement. He would go to individual confession and absolution multiple times per day. Because he realized he'd sinned between breakfast and lunch, so he had to go before the, the, the lunchtime service and go confess his sins too. Because what happens if I choke on a chicken bone at lunch? Then I'm going to die with these sins that haven't been confessed yet. And I'm going to go to hell. And Luther's father confessor, Johann von Staupitz. Gotta love it. He supposedly said to Luther, Luther... You have been here more than any other monk in this cloister. You have been here five times a day for the last month. And you have yet to confess anything remotely interesting. Go away until you got a biggie. Because he was so weighed down by this canon of omnis utriusque. If you don't name every single little thing. And so for Luther, it included, I was on my hands and knees washing the floor, and I missed a spot. So I didn't fulfill my duty. Would that we examined our own lives even half that stringently. Enumeration is free to everyone, but it's not compelled upon anyone. Those things that are troubling you. And it is done because this is derived from the office of the keys. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm starting to get into the, uh, the Schmalkald articles here as well, which came uh, seven years later as they were preparing for a, a general council of the church. They were going to call everybody together for a council to answer this Lutheran question. And, well, it ended up kind of like 15 days to flatten the curve. You know, we're going to call this council in 15 days. 
well, next month, um, sometime in the next year, um, well, maybe next year. Oddly enough, six months after Luther dies, okay, we're ready to have the council now. Since Luther could not be there to defend himself, they finally called the council. But as Luther was anticipating and, and expecting this council to be called, <coughs> excuse me, he, uh, he wrote down um, some things to help those who were going to be there because he did not anticipate that he was going to live long enough to be there at the council. So in 1537, they wrote down, he wrote down these theological ideas. Because next year I might not be here. I'm a fat German who drinks too much. I might not be here. And oh, by the way, half of the armies of Europe are hunting me down. I might not be here. 1537, he says. Friday was the anniversary of Luther's death. 1537, he was writing this down, because I might not be here next month. Luther died. Show all notes. Luther died... 1546. And I write this down because I'm not going to be here next year. It's more than nine years later before he died. Grandma said that every Thanksgiving for 10 years. Yep, this is going to be my last one. And in writing this down, he's emphasizing that the office of the keys is that divinely instituted thing. This is why the church does this absolution thing. This is a God thing. This is something that God has given, and absolution must be spoken from outside of you. So this is not a God and me moment in your little prayer closet. God gives his word of forgiveness to be spoken into your ears from outside of you. There about two-thirds of the way down on the page you see um, Luther starts to talk about the enthusiasts. Now, Just as a demonstration that this is not just a Pastor Moore problem, Luther then spends the next eight paragraphs going down the rabbit hole of enthusiasm instead of talking about confession. I come by it honestly. Luther is talking about the enthusiasts, and, and that's... That's an expression that, you know, we have come to understand enthusiasm as excitement. Yeah! That's enthusiasm. When it's used in a theological term, you have to remember enthusiasm according to its roots. En, which means in. Feu, God. God is inside of you. So you just have to go into your little prayer closet and listen to your little still small voice and that is the true unadulterated word of God for you to follow. Are you stuck in a bad marriage? Go into your prayer closet and when you come out and say... Well, God told me I made a mistake, so I needed to divorce my husband and find my true soulmate. I'm not breaking the sixth commandment at all because God told me it was okay.
when I had encountered a, a young man who had fathered three children by three different women, was at that time living with the mother of his third child, and his mom, in, in hopes, you know how moms always hold out hope, that he was going to be coming to communion, put his name down on the communion card, he's going to be here for communion next week. He is openly living with someone who is not his wife. And everybody knows it. And so I go have a conversation with him about some of the choices that he's made and holding them up to God's word in how we ought to order our lives. And that there is forgiveness and a way to move forward in forgiveness and grace. Mama Bear comes to my office and these were the words out of her mouth. If God told him it was okay for him to move in with this woman and he doesn't have a problem coming to communion, who are you to tell him that this could be harmful to him? There's a six, there's this thing called the Sixth Commandment. And I'm not saying any of us has ever actually fully kept this, but we all live under this by grace. And we confess our sin according to it. But if he doesn't see that he's not doing anything wrong, or if he doesn't see that he's doing anything wrong, who are you to tell him he's doing something wrong? God sends his word from the outside. God speaks his law from the outside and says this is wrong. And God sends his gospel from the outside and says you are forgiven this. And that's what this individual Confession and absolution does is it brings this word of forgiveness from the outside into your ears regarding those specific things that you recognize that you've done wrong. And this time of individual confession gives an opportunity. For God, through his word, and that examination, and that catechesis that happens during that confession, to sit there and go, oh, that thing that I thought was helpful, the thing that I thought I was doing right, that's, that really was the wrong thing to be doing. That's not how I should be ordering my life. God, forgive me. You know, the whole world is telling me, this is the way you're supposed to do it. I didn't realize God was giving me a different word. It all comes back to that emphasis on the external word, that word spoken in the sacraments, that word spoken into our ears in confession and absolution. And so absolution is something that must be spoken upon you from outside of yourself. And that is why our Lord has established within his church this right of individual confession and absolution. Next week, we're going to walk through 
the actual the right as it appears in our hymnal um, and it's something that actually uh, because the remember the office of the keys is given to the church pastors exercise that publicly on behalf of God within the church but the forgiveness that we speak one Christian to another is this same office of the keys when daughter irritates mom or mom frustrates daughter and there's fourth commandment things going on there there's Ephesians 6 stuff going on there fathers do not exasperate your children children obey your parents okay the amount of eye rolling between parents and children that go on when you sin against one another you can do this with regards to those sins that have committed, been committed against you because the forgiveness that you speak about the sins committed against you is also the forgiveness of God there is a, a brochure up here um, from an organization called Ambassadors of Reconciliation and I'm going to uh, you can take these today if you want to um, I'm going to be referring to them in next week's class as well um, and they're also going to be going out in the newsletters um, to every household um, and and it has the it has the right from Lutheran service book in here um, so it has the order of confession and then it has if you're doing this with a pastor or if you're doing it with a family member here's how you speak that word of forgiveness back to that person who is confessing and so we're going to walk through that and and then i'm also going to, sh to show you the, the just the nuts and bolts of how we're going to be doing it um, before the Lenten services um, this year um, in the in the nave so we'll start out in here and then we're going to take a field trip into the nave um, and, and I'll show you those nuts and bolts things then as well we are way over time so I'm going to close with a word of prayer dear God our Heavenly Father we thank you for the gift of your grace and your mercy be with us as we live our lives as your people speaking that forgiveness to one another living in the mercy of Christ send your holy angels to be with us to guard and protect us as we shine the light of forgiveness into this world that those who do not know your grace and your mercy may see your grace at work in us and by the working of your Holy Spirit and the word that we speak to them may be brought to faith. All this we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.